Dark Angels or Imperial Fists? Ultramarines or Death Watch? Let's talk about which Space Marine chapter to play in Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're going to be talking through the Space Marine chapters. Choosing which chapter to play is one of the biggest decisions that you might make when playing a Space Marine army, and hopefully this video might help a bit with that. We'll go through each major chapter and a bunch of successors, talk about their lore and background, which unique miniatures and options they might have, how they play in game, and their rough relative strength compared with the others in Warhammer 40k at the moment. This video is aimed to be an update on the one I made around a year ago. There's been an entire new addition to the game and a new Space Marine Codex since then, so hopefully this might be able to offer a few more current insights. In any case, loads to talk about, so let's jump straight in with the Ultramarines. So the Ultramarines are perhaps some of the poster boys of Warhammer 40k. Their iconic blue power armour has often graced the covers of the Space Marine Codex and the painting style of the 40k starter sets. The Ultramarines are perhaps the archetypical Space Marine chapter, heavily compliant with the Codex Astartes written by Rebute Gilliman himself, and draw quite a lot from Roman themes, governing a mini-empire all of their own in their realm of Ultramar from the capital of Macrag. The Ultramarines are absolutely central to the 40k plotline, and their legendary deeds are near endless. In recent times, Rebute Gilliman has even been restored to the realm of the living via some Eldar magic, and is now Lord Commander of the Imperium, a demigod returned to turn back the forces of Chaos and Xenos. The Ultramarines are quite favoured in terms of unique miniatures, they have an enormous amount of character miniatures, perhaps the most recent sculpts being Rebute Gilliman, Chief Librarian Targaryus, Marnius Kalgar, and Uriel Ventris. There are many others besides though, and Games Workshop does also sell a unique upgrade sprue for each major Space Marine chapter, where you can get some nice shoulder pads with their insignia and a few iconic weapons. In game, the Ultramarines absolutely favour the doctrine of tactical flexibility, bringing both a little bit of shooting and melee to the table, and they have multiple strong command characters, Gilliman and Kalgar being able to get amazing value out of nearby units. Their chapter tactics allow them to fall back and shoot and have better leadership, they get rapid firing bolters even on the move up to long ranges, and they can redeploy a few units at the start of the game, a really powerful move to allow them to counter enemy deployments. In current power, I'd say they're medium to strong in strength, maybe not enormous amounts of raw power just from their chapter tactic, but a number of helpful options and powerful characters that can allow them to win games better than others. Next up, we come to the White Scars, the White Armoured's murderous biker chapter, who are famed above all other chapters for their sheer speed, fast hit and run tactics, and are certainly reminiscent of Mongolian cavalry tactics, though swapping equine steeds for powerful space marine bikes. Their Primarch was Jagatai Khan, who was lost in the webway long ago, and their current chapter master Yubol Khan leads their great hunts forward from their homeworld of Chigoris. For unique miniatures, they have a nice new Primarch sculpt of Corsaro Khan, an expert duelist and head taker, and an upgrade kit that makes a biker HQ called a Khan on bike. In game, as you'd expect, the White Scars are incredibly fast, and they're really quite assault orientated as well. Their chapter tactics allow them to advance and charge, typically moving 20 inches when you're on bikes, fall back and charge for some excellent skirmishing, and they have a devastatingly powerful assault doctrine as well, where they get plus one damage on all their weapons whenever they do make a charge. Currently, I'd say they're one of the stronger Space Marine chapters. Getting heavy hitting melee to exactly where they need it is no small thing. Next up, we come to the Raven Guard, the covert and stealth orientated Space Marine Legion. They're famed for their jump pack assaults and guerrilla tactics, often striking from the shadows to hit the enemy and sever supply lines where they're least expected. They employ many Phobos armoured Primaris and Space Marine scouts, often equipped with sniper rifles to hunt down enemy characters, and the chapter is somewhat dour and brooding in character. They seem to have acquired a bit of a goth theme over the years. Their Primarch Corvus Corax was last seen fighting Lorgar in the midst of the Eye of Terror, and has been lost ever since. Their homeworld is Deliverance, and their chapter master is the newly promoted Shadow Master Kayvon Shrike, at time of recording the only Primaris Space Marine to bear lightning claws. Shrike is their only unique miniature, though he is quite a nice and recent sculpt, and is fairly strong in game, being able to move very fast, give out full hit rerolls, and he's good in melee too. Their gameplay revolves around redeployment and infiltration abilities, they have stratagems and warlord traits to allow their units to start up very close to the enemy, and then maybe give them a devastating alpha strike on turn 1. Their stealthy chapter tactics will allow them to be very hard to kill at range, getting minus 1 to hit while they're in cover, and potentially even counting as being in cover out in the open. Their unique combat doctrine is also good for severing the enemy command, they get plus 1 to hit and wound against characters whenever they're in tactical doctrine. 
Despite all this, and being quite strong throughout 8th edition, the Raven Guard do seem to be struggling a bit in 9th. It's not that they don't have powerful options that they can deploy, but they seem to be rather overshadowed by some of the other chapters. Perhaps some of their strongest options as well aren't necessarily playing in the fluffiest way, using their infiltration mechanics to get powerful armies of Gravis armour or Centurions into battle, as they're often the units that benefit the most from getting up close and personal very quickly. Still though, they've got some interesting options, and remain a really fun army to play. Moving on, we come to the Iron Hands, a highly logical and merciless chapter, with little room for compromise or flexibility within their battle tactics. The Iron Hands believe the flesh is weak and favour machines, dreadnoughts and bionic augmentations to further prove their efficiency in killing the enemy. Their Primarch Ferris Manus was killed by Fulgrim at the Isvan drop site massacre during the Horus Heresy, and their chapter hailed from their homeworld of Medusa and are led by the Iron Council rather than a single chapter master, though the voice piece of the council at this point is a card and Stronos. Currently, their only unique miniature is Iron Father Phyros, a Primaris Iron Father with a heavy bolter. He can heal vehicles and buff their shooting, and also provides an invul save to nearby infantry. In game, the Iron Hands are particularly tough with those bionic augmentations. Every model in the army gets a 6 plus shrug off against any damage inflicted and their vehicles in particular will keep on going longer, not degrading as fast to enemy damage. They tend to be a lot more firepower oriented over close combat, particularly with their first turn Devastator Doctrine, allowing them to move and shoot with no penalty to heavy weapons, and giving them reroll ones to hit. They've got a lot of other synergies with vehicles though, aside from just their chapter tactic, psychic powers to make them hit better or make their armour tougher, and lots of ways that you can repair them. Iron Hands used to be the single strongest army in the game throughout 8th edition, but after receiving successive nerfs and FAQs to their codex, they're now more on the moderate to weaker end of the Space Marine lineup. They still have plenty of interesting and powerful tricks though, and if you want to run a lot of vehicles in a Space Marine army, then you might struggle to do better than these guys. Moving on, we come to the Salamanders, the green armoured Space Marines of Nocturne, who are legendary weaponsmiths and crafters with a particular fondness for fire. The Legion is also known for its absolute jet black skin, and abnormally humanitarian and protective of Imperial citizens, compared with quite a lot of the other Space Marine chapters who feel that such things are beneath them, and are easily happy to expend innocent lives if it would better serve the Emperor. Their Primarch Vulcan was near unkillable and known to be a perpetual, though he was lost following the War of the Beast, when he and the single most powerful orc that ever lived were presumably destroyed in a nuclear explosion. In terms of unique miniatures, the Salamanders both have Adrax Agatone, the Primaris Captain, and Vulcan Hestan, the Forge Father, whose task it is to recover the lost relics of Vulcan in the belief that when these are restored, the Primarch will return to the Salamanders chapter. In game, the Salamanders tend to be slow moving, but strong and mighty. They don't have many mobility buffs or anything, but both their chapter tactic, combat doctrine, and their stratagems and powers usually tend to make them more durable or harder hitting up close. In particular, they get on very well with Melter and Flamer weapons, with a plus one to wound for both of these whenever they're in Tactical Doctrine, making these weapons incredibly efficient choices for them. Currently, I'd say their power is fairly medium. They can hit very, very hard in the right circumstances, but they lost quite a lot when they changed from the one Space Marine Codex to the next, particularly things like Flamestorm Aggressors being able to double fire. Still though, they certainly have their advantages, and if you'd like to field a very fiery green-clad army of smiths and weapon crafters, then the Salamanders might be for you. The Imperial Fists are the defenders of the heart of the Imperium, descendants of their Primarch Rogal Dawn, and are technically a fleet-based chapter operating out of the Phalanx, though they will typically stay very close to the heart of the Imperium, as one of their main duties is to defend Terra and the heart of the Imperium itself against enemy threats. To this end, they're masters of siege warfare, fortifying against all invaders, particularly their hated foes the Iron Warriors, their bitter rivals from the Chaos Legions. If the Imperial Fists have a fault, they might be getting drawn into heroic last stands that don't necessarily need to happen, though many a great victory has been won from the jaws of defeat by an Imperial Fist force that's refused to yield despite all odds. The details on their chapter master are a little bit in question. In the latest Codex, a Gregor Decium was listed, but little is known about him. His successor was believed to have been slain in the events around the fall of Cadia. Miniatures-wise, the Fists have access to Captain Lysander here, the Hammer of Dawn bearing a Thunder Hammer and Storm Shield, and Tor Garadon, a recently promoted Primaris Captain. In game, they're perhaps the most heavily shooting orientated out of any of the chapters, having little to no advantages in melee compared with the others. Their chapter tactic is quite a good one, any bolt weapons get extra hits on sixes, making those weapons really efficient with Imperial Fists, they get to ignore cover, and they've got a couple of helpful options for shooting, including the Eye of Hypnoth for some rerolls, and the Tank Hunter's Stratagem to help them bring down enemy heavies. 
Despite this, however, the Imperial Fists do remain one of the weakest Space Marine chapters right now. Aside from a good chapter tactic, unfortunately a lot of their codex just wasn't really very strong when it came out, and after losing their all-game Devastator Doctrine, there's not really all that much that they do well aside from bolt weapons. The Crimson Fists are a famed successor chapter of Imperial Fist lineage, and bear a lot of similarities to the Sons of Dawn. They were notably brought to at the brink of destruction by an orc invasion of their homeworld, Rin's World. Chapter Master Pedro Cantor was forced to lead a valiant fight back, brutally purging their world of greenskins, but shattered with the loss of so many of their precious relics and war gear with the destruction of their fortress monastery. They have a unique miniature in Pedro Cantor here, gives out some solid benefits to nearby Crimson Fists, including making nearby units better with plus one attack in combat. Gameplay wise, they're very similar to the Imperial Fists, they still get the Bolter buff, and instead of ignoring cover, they get a bonus against hordes, no doubt due to their orc fighting days. Generally most other options are the same though, aside from Cantor himself, and they have a few extra Warlord traits and a nice Relic Power Fist. Generally though, they are just another flavour of Imperial Fists, and I'm afraid that does make them similarly struggling in 9th edition. The Black Templars are a vast splintered chapter of Knightly Marines, who operate very differently to most Space Marine chapters, as rather than having a set homeworld and set numbers, they operate from constantly moving Crusade fleets, recruiting and gaining resources from the worlds that they pass. Constantly on the move to purge the galaxy from Xenos and Chaos, the Templars typically field large squads of space marines, black-clad tides of initiates and neophytes, often disembarking from land raiders to carve the Emperor's judgement into the enemy with a chainsword. The Black Templars are again Imperial Fist successors, though differ almost completely in their organisation and fighting style. Their current commander-in-chief is High Marshal Helbrecht, who is represented in his own miniature, along with Chaplain Grimaldus, the feared Emperor's champion, and they also have some nice robed sword brethren miniatures and quite a big upgrade sprue as they go. In terms of Black Templar parts that you get for the investment, it's quite impressive compared with the other things that Games Workshop sell for the other chapters. In game, the Black Templars are highly melee focused. Their chapter tactic allows them to re-roll charges and get into combat a bit more reliably, and their unique assault doctrine which they can access early with the Crusader Helm allows them to auto-wound things on sixes. They have access to their own unique Crusader squads, which are the cheapest power-armoured loyalist space marines. They combine this with a few helpful stratagems and a couple of good relics in their unique chaplain litanies, and they can get quite a lot of advantages over the opponents in close combat. I would bear in mind that at the moment the Black Templars are one of the only main chapters without a codex supplement all to themselves. Currently they have the standard Space Marine Codex plus a digital download index document. It means they perhaps are a little bit less supported in terms of the book, but I guess at least it's free compared with having to shell out for an additional book on top of the Space Marine Codex. I think there's at least a reasonable chance of them getting their own supplement sometime in 9th edition. For their current power level, they do have their own interesting tricks, but I'd still rate them somewhere on the moderate to weaker side. They just tend to be somewhat outshone with the other chapters, who actually get massive buffs to their melee damage output, not just getting into combat. They definitely can be strong though, and if you fancy a nightly crusading order of space marines charging into battle, then Black Templars might be for you. Next up, we're getting into the more significantly divergent space marine chapters, and we'll start with the Dark Angels. The Dark Angels really epitomise the monastic nightly order aspect of space marines, often bearing robes and incense sensors, and are a highly secretive chapter, fearfully protectful of their terrible secrets from the Horus Heresy when half of their legions succumb to the will of chaos. As well as fighting for the Imperium on all fronts, they also have their secret agenda of constantly hunting down the fallen Dark Angels, and they have specialist formations within their chapter to help them do so, the black-clad Ravenwing bikers to seek them out, and then summoning in the Deathwing Terminator squads to deal the hammer blow of death to the traitors. They have a particular infinity for plasma weapons, and their own unique interrogator chaplains. Their Primarch Lion L. Johnson hailed from Caliban, which was destroyed during the Angel's Fall, and now the chapter's fortress monastery is based on the rock, a final chattered chunk of their planet, where it's rumoured that the Primarch still slumbers, ready to lead the Legion forward in their hour of utmost need. Compared with the chapters that we've talked about so far, the Dark Angels, Blood Angels and Space Wolves are absolutely massively supported with their own unique lineups. The Dark Angels have their iconic Road Veteran Space Marines here, unique Ravenwing units, including Black Knights, the Dark Shroud and Dark Talon Flyers, and the Landspeed of Vengeance and Dark Shroud. The Deathwing have their own unique Terminators and Deathwing Knights, and they also have many unique character units, from Grandmaster Azrael, Belial and Samael, the heads of the Deathwing and the Ravenwing, and the relatively recent re-sculpt of Master Lazarus, a unique Primaris Captain. Rules-wise, the Dark Angels are a pretty fortunate Space Marine chapter right now, they're strong all round, and can certainly do both ranged and melee strategies, 
tending to revolve around their unique Deathwing and Ravenwing options. The Deathwing Terminators are really hard to kill efficiently, you can only ever wound them on a 4 or more, and the Ravenwing units have lots of their own unique stratagem options, a 5 plus invulnerable save whenever they're on the move, and they get the objective secured special rule allowing them to snatch objectives away from the enemy. As if that weren't enough, the entire chapter also gets plus 1 to hit whenever they're stationary, their Grim Resolve massively amping up the firepower of stationary units or even melee units when the opponent charges them. Currently, the Dark Angels are very strong indeed, arguably the strongest Space Marine chapter at the moment, and certainly a challenging force to best on the battlefield. Moving on, we come to the red-clad Angels of Death, the Blood Angels. The Sons of Sanguinius are angelic tragic heroes of Warhammer 40k, perpetually haunted by their visions of the dying Primarch, slain by the hand of the War Master himself during the Horus Heresy. These savage echoes can awaken a friends of bloodlust in the noble Blood Angels, and they are afflicted by the twin flaws of the Red Thirst and the Black Rage, which can lead to frenzied bouts of bloodlust and a slow descent into madness. The Blood Angels hail from their homeworld of Baal, and have long been bitter enemies of the Tyranids of High Fleet Leviathan, recently leading a desperate defence against the Bogs with the help of all their successor chapters combined. Their chapter master is the ancient Commander Dante, who has been made Lord Regent of the Imperium Nihilus, charged with protecting the Imperial subjects that are now far from the Emperor's reach due to the Cicatrix Maledictum. Like the Dark Angels, the Blood Angels also have an extensive miniature range. They have many unique characters of their own, a lot of which are borne aloft on jump packs, testimony to the wings of Sanguinius and Blood Angels' love of flight. They can feel the brutal Death Company, who have descended into madness and seek only a noble death in combat, and the exemplary Sanguinary Guard with their winged jump packs and golden armour. They also have unique Furioso pattern combat dreadnoughts and the close-range firepower of the Baal Predator so again, are relatively lucky in the amount of kits that they get compared with other chapters. Gameplay-wise, the Blood Angels are a brutal, hard-hitting assault force, getting the incredibly helpful combo of plus one to charge and then plus one to wound when they get there. There's a big emphasis on powerful and hard-hitting jump pack units charging into combat and cutting the enemy to ribbons. Power-wise, I'd say they're currently quite strong, maybe a little bit over-reliant on their own chapter tactic and the Sanguinary Guard. A lot of their stratagems and unique options aren't desperately stand out, but the combination of these units and rules alone certainly keeps them in the running. If you want to play as bloodthirsty fallen berserker angels, then the blood angels might be for you. Next up we come to the Space Wolves, the Nordic and Viking inspired Space Marine chapter, with an extreme fixation on wolves and all things lupine. Space Wolves have the Canis Helix, which makes them unusually savage, elongates their incisors, and if left unchecked, can potentially lead for the Space Wolves to descend into savage wolfen, uncontrollable werewolf-like Space Marines. The Space Wolves are organised into great companies, each led by wolf lords who carve out their own storage saga, and the chapter has a bitter rivalry with the Sorcerers of the Thousand Sons, following them being dispatched by the Emperor to burn the homeworld of Prospero down during the Horus Heresy. Again, the Space Wolves are very well supported, they perhaps have the most unique characters out of any of the chapters available, such as their emphasis on heroes carving out sagas. They've got a couple of shock assault units in the Thunderwolf Cavalry, Space Marines riding giant wolves, and the Savage Wolfen, some unique vehicles with Bjorn the Fell Handed, Murderfang and some other unique dreadnoughts and flyers, and their famed Wolfguard Terminators and their own unique troop choices in the Grey Hunters and the Impetuous Blood Claws. In game, not too dissimilarly from the Blood Angels, the Space Wolves hit very, very hard in combat though without the plus one to charge, they maybe are a little bit tougher to get there. They have lots of powerful upgrades that can make their heroes hit a lot harder, and their chapter tactics give them a plus one to hit in combat, and an interesting heroic intervention mechanic where the Space Wolves will charge into combat if any enemies get too close. Power-wise, again, they are quite strong. An army of tough, savage melee units do well in ninth, though maybe not quite on top-tier par like the Dark Angels. In any case, if you like the idea of Viking or Nordic-themed Space Marines, including ones that literally ride wolves into battle, then perhaps the Space Wolves might be for you. Next up, we come to the Xenos Hunting Special Forces of the Death Watch. This elite force of Space Marines is unusually combined from many different chapters, and are the specialist alien hunters of the Inquisition, drawing together bands of skilled warriors as they are needed for a given mission, and specialising in hyper-elite kill teams, teleporting into battle, and employing the exact tactics needed to crush the machinations of the enemies of the Emperor. In battle, the Death Watch make war in black power armour, with a silver left shoulder pad bearing the Litany Xena Mortis, and their right shoulder pad denoting the chapter that they hail from, proudly displaying the heraldry of their parent chapter. They have a fair amount of their own unique miniatures, they have Watchmasters armed with Guardian Spears, Captain Artemis, their highly flexible and customizable kill team kit, and a unique flyer in the Corvus Blackstar. 
There's also a kit of Monopose miniatures called Kill Team Cassius, which has some really nice flavourful Death Watch miniatures, really embodying the different flavours of the chapters that they're drawn from. Gameplay wise, they're a bit more wide in scope now they've got access to the entire Space Marine armory. Previously, they were just limited to a few kill teams and things. Their general focus is infantry focused tactics and close range firepower, and you can build mixed multi specialist kill teams, combining unusual combinations such as jump packs, bikes, and regular power armored marines all into the same squad. Their core game mechanics are using things like special issue ammunition, where they can select the round that they're going to put into their bolters before they fire it, mission tactics to mess with the order of their doctrines and to give them a damage buff against certain battlefield roles, and they have a host of Xenos specific stratagems where they can be particularly good at killing things like Eldar, Orcs or Necrons. Despite all this, and quite a number of interesting relics and warlord traits, they do still seem to be one of the weakest Space Marine chapters out of the lot. Their special issue ammo was quite toned down in the new codex, and their unique tricks just don't seem to be enough to sell them compared with other chapters. They still have very few big tournament performances in the whole of 9th edition. Still though, they can still make a strong army if built around correctly, and if you like the idea of teleporting strike squads with all sorts of special fancy gear, then the Death Watch might be something to look into. Diverging from Codex Space Marines now, we come to the Grey Knights. Again, the Grey Knights are kind of a special forces chapter, though where the Death Watch hunt Xenos and aliens, the Grey Knights are dedicated to rooting out chaos, and specifically demons. The Grey Knights are a shadowy organisation, each member an incorruptible psyker, augmented by the Emperor's own gene seas, and bearing powerful force weapons and storm bolters into battle to better banish the demons back into the warp. They are guided by the foresight of their prognosticors to show up whenever demon incursions happen, and are merciless in their pursuit of the taint of chaos. Even the suspicion that a planet's populace might have been contaminated could lead to them destroying the population of the entire world. In terms of unique miniatures, a fair few of their options are represented by their flexible strike squad kits, who can also be fielded as purgation squads and purifiers. They have their own unique terminators, the mech suit that is the nemesis dread knight, and a small collection of special characters, including Supreme Grandmaster Caldor Drago, Captain Stern, Castell and Crow, and Grandmaster Voldus. It's rumoured that they'll be getting an update to Castell and Crow in an upcoming box set where they'll be fighting the Thousand Sons. Gameplay wise, the Grey Knights really are a hyper elite Space Marine chapter. Combining some fairly devastating close range anti infantry fire with those storm bolters and strong melee with those multi damaged force weapons that they carry almost to a man. They can get these squads into position with teleport strikes, augment them with all manner of psychic powers, and they have several specific benefits against demons, including helping to smite them off the table with their tides of the warp. Currently, the Grey Knights aren't doing too strongly in Warhammer 40k, they were doing okay towards the end of 8th edition, but in 9th they're somewhat outcompeted by armies like Custodes and they certainly weren't helped by having their smite nerfs at the start of the edition. Things could certainly change around for them quite a lot though, their new codex is out soon, and I'm sure that it will give them a powerful buff. Of course you don't have to stick with one of these main codex chapters, you can either make your own, or paint the space ruins along the lines of one of the many many successor chapters that are present in the lore. There are far too many successor chapters to name, but here are a few of the more notable ones. The Flesh Terrors are Blood Angel successors, hailing from Cretacea, and led by the famed Gabriel Seth, they have their own unique section in the Blood Angels Codex, getting some unique relics, war gear, and options. The Red Scorpions were a chapter made famous by Forge World. Their lineage is unknown, but they made a great name for themselves during the Bad Ab War, countering the machinations of Huron Blackheart. The chapter is renowned for its fanatical purity, holding themselves to far higher standards than even the Imperial Inquisition, and refusing to serve alongside any they consider tainted. They have a few of their own unique character models, their rules available in the Imperial Armor Compendium. The Blood Ravens are again a chapter of unknown lineage, though there is a heretical rumour that they may have been descended from Thousand Sons Gene Seed. They do seem to have an affinity with quite a lot of psychers amongst their ranks, and they do have a curious habit of borrowing other chapters' relics and war gear, and then not giving them back. The Blood Ravens were particularly made famous by the Dawn of War computer game franchise, and there's even a very snazzy Forge World model for Gabriel Angelos, their chapter master. Finally, the Raptors are led by Lias Isidon, and are a Dower Raven Guard successor chapter, with an unusually pragmatic and fatalist outlook compared with other Space Marine chapters. They employ camouflage and guile where possible, and look down on chapters that flaunt their heraldry, seeing them as needlessly proud, and more focused on showing off than serving the Emperor. In game, there are rules for successor chapters within the Space Marine Codex. They have a slightly unusual system where you pick any two traits from a list, and that's how you make your chapter tactic, and then they use most of the other rules from a parent chapter. So say you could have a successor chapter with the Whirlwind of Rage and Hungry for Battle traits, 
and then state that they're a successor of the White Scars Legion. Just for the most part, the main chapters do tend to be a bit stronger than the successor chapter traits, but there are a few exceptions. Raven Guard pair very well with combat buffs, they're able to get some scary melee units very close indeed, and sometimes going for a trait combo like Stealthy for a bit of cover even in the open, and Master Artisans for a little bit of extra damage increase, might be preferable if you're trying to field a Space Marine chapter in a way that doesn't really make good use of their chapter tactic. You do lose a few options for this, obviously your standard chapter tactic, but also any special characters that hail from the chapter, and you have poorer access to the higher tier of relics within each supplement book. There are some trade-offs, but sometimes it could be a good way to go tactically. In addition, there's a few chapters that got White Dwarf releases, storage chapters such as the Silver Templars from the Warhammer Conquest magazines, the Cursed Exorcists, who have a little bit too much demonic possession going on to be trusted by most of the other chapters, and the Emperor's Spears, a rather nautical and Poseidon-esque chapter, made famous by the novel Spear of the Emperor. These all have set successor chapter traits, they have their own parent chapter that they must hail from, and then get a few extra bits of kit, such as unique warlord traits, relics and stratagems. Finally, there are plenty of successor chapters from Forge World, the Minotaurs, Red Scorpions and Carcharodons being some of the most notable. These have suggested chapter traits and pairings in the Forge World Imperial Armour Compendium, but there's nothing actually rules as written that say you have to use these if you want to use something else. All of these have a few unique character data sheets from the Imperial Armour Compendium, and one of the main draws to field them is being able to field those options. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed a brief tour through the Space Marine chapters in Warhammer 40k. Please feel free to let me know which ones are your favourite and why down in the comments below. If you'd like to see more like this, feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics, where I'll most certainly be keeping these videos coming, with new content for Warhammer 40k coming out just about every day. Finally, if you'd like to help support the channel and keep these videos coming, I would just like to mention that the channel has a Patreon page down in the video description below. Channel patrons do have a fair few advantages, such as seeing certain new videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next for Auspets Tactics, and automatic entry into the channel's monthly prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.